Today we want to come as we get back into our study of Mark's gospel, and um, we come to now a very interesting passage, and I have to be totally honest with you. I started working on um, preparation for this weeks ago, and, and I find that we, have, we don't have enough time today to unpack all that there is here. So I'm going to ask you to understand this, that if we wanted to unpack and dive deep into every implication of this passage, we could be here uh, for days and weeks. Mark's gospel, though, is a fast-paced gospel. It's different than the other gospels. Each of them is the same in that the purpose of the writer is to present Jesus Christ, the Savior and the Messiah. That's the purpose of every gospel. And it's uh, every gospel writer is somewhat unique with their voice. And every gospel writer, not deviating from that purpose, is going to emphasize things a little bit differently. Here we see with Mark, he is moving in somewhat of a, a fast pace. And so we are going to stay true to Mark's gospel writing, and, and we're going to move through this passage. But there are some things that I really want to highlight, and you're going to see uh, the main point will definitely come through is the main point. One thing that really impacted me as I was studying uh, was, was a sermon that was delivered in 1880 by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. And he titled his sermon, Christ's Transfigured Face. And this uh, sermon of his was based on the Matthew account. Here's what he said. While our Lord uh, Jesus Christ was upon this earth, he was as much divine as before he left his father's court in heaven. He never ceased to be God, nor was the Godhead for a single moment separated from his humanity. He was, therefore, always glorious. Yet was there a greater glory about him than could usually be seen. This may seem to be a paradox, but it is true. For Christ to be glorious was almost a less matter than for him to restrain or hide his glory. It is forever his glory that he concealed his glory, and that, though he was rich, for our sakes he became poor. Though he was God over all, blessed forever, he made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. A lot of times we're tempted when we view something as magnificent as the transfiguration, that we think that a miracle happened whereby Jesus became divine. Absolutely not. Perhaps the greatest miracle, as Spurgeon said, was Jesus restraining his glory from burning through his very existence and consuming all of us. And it's with that sort of a perspective that I would like for us to approach this passage here today. That we have Jesus and the veil that is pulled back for just a moment. And we see probably just a portion of his glory burning through his very existence, even burning through his very clothes that he was wearing. Now, in the days leading up to this event, that probably happened on top of Mount Hermon, because that mountain was closest to the setting for this story where Jesus has been shifting his attention from from evangelistic efforts to the crowds, he is now shifting his attention to his disciples. And this is about discipleship. The region is Caesarea Philippi. And, and Mount Hermon stands and, and casts a shadow upon this region. This is probably the mountain where this is taking place, though we cannot be totally sure. But basically, Jesus has just finished telling his disciples the Son of Man must suffer. The Son of Man is going to die. And the Son of Man will be risen again. And understand that you also will suffer. And the implication here is you also will die. This is the message of discipleship. This is the cost of discipleship. And Jesus has made this clear to his disciples, but they don't fully grasp. 
They can't fully wrap their, their brains around what he is saying, which is why at the end of this passage, his disciples are still asking questions even after they've seen him transfigured. And so Jesus, Jesus, this is the setting. Jesus has been teaching them. Jesus wants them to understand. And they've been dropped a heavy load upon them. The load is, I'm going to die, Jesus says. And you will too. And they're trying to wrap their brains around it all. And you have to imagine the sorrow that they are feeling. That their beloved Savior, who, Jesus, who, who Peter has just confessed on behalf of the rest of the disciples, is not going to just transition into glory. He is going to suffer first the suffering then the glory. And they can't understand the suffering part. And so Jesus brings them in the midst of this probably despair, and he brings them up onto this mountain, three of his closest disciples, Peter, James, and John. And he is going to give them some encouragement. And this is timely encouragement. And he's going to give them assurance That what I have been saying and what I have been demonstrating, you're going to see something that is going to uh, absolutely confirm all that has been said and done. So this is where we are. This is what we're going to be dealing with today. The disciples, these three, would see Jesus for who he really is. And in the transfiguration account, we too can see Jesus for who he really is. Number one, we see that Jesus is the revelation of God's glory. Jesus is the revelation of God's glory. And we see in Mark chapter 9, verse 2, And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter and James and John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. So we have his three closest disciples. Isn't it interesting that what they are about to witness it includes three witnesses. Doesn't, a, doesn't something that happens, isn't truth confirmed on the basis of two or three witnesses? And here we have three witnesses, his inner circle. But there will be even greater witnesses than these three, and we'll get to that in a moment. Also note that it says that after six days, and you'll notice if you were to go and look in the Matthew account and in the Luke account, Luke says in particular after about eight days. Well, if you count that moment when Jesus foreshadowed what this transfiguration was to happen and what happened thereafter, then we get about eight days. There's no contradiction of Scripture. I just want you to understand that. Perfectly reconciled as we have just a different way of counting the circumstances between these gospel writers. No contradiction at all. And they're on a high mountain. Isn't it interesting that God speaks, and when God reveals plans in his glory, it seems to happen on top of high mountains. Mount Sinai, for example. There's so much in this passage that points back to the Old Testament and then turns around and brings us back forward to the New Testament to see the fulfillment of it all. Jesus is the revelation of God's glory, which has always existed and will always exist. Eternity past through eternity future. Jesus is the very expression of that at the transfiguration. Let's notice two truths if we could. And we're going to try to move through here as uh, quickly as we can. Number one, understand this, that God the Son revealed who he was in this passage. He didn't become who he had not been. Number one, he reveals who he was and always had been. He does not become in the transfiguration who he had not been. That's very important for us to understand. So, I've said a word. It starts with T, kids. What is that word that I've said? It's kind of a big word. It might be somewhat of a tongue twister. What is that word that that has to do with him outwardly expressing what's already on the inside. Transfiguration. I had a snap malfunction. Usually it's much better than that. Yeah, there we go. The transfiguration. So lock that word in your brains, okay? At the... 
transfiguration, the disciples saw Jesus as he really is. The disciples saw Jesus as he really is. Notice the present tense that I framed that statement. He is, because he's alive today. Kids, adults, Jesus is alive today. And, and he has always existed since eternity past and will always exist into eternity future. And so he, the disciples saw Jesus as he really is. Now take that word transfigured, metamorpho. It's from the Greek, metamorpho, which means to change on the outside, uh, a change that happens on the outside that comes from the inside. Okay? There isn't an exterior force that has affected change. It is rather something that happens that, that has already existed on the inside, and think of it as bubbling out. Think of it as, really, in terms of, of Jesus' glory, it bursts out. That's why Spurgeon said it was almost a greater thing for him to restrain his glory than it was for him to express his glory. Because his glory is always existent. But he has to restrain it. And that's what he's been doing up until this point. It's the opposite of masquerade. To masquerade, that's an outward change that doesn't come from within. You put a mask on, you masquerade. But Jesus doesn't put a mask on. Jesus peels something off. And that's his glory that is on full display. And so for a limited time and to a limited degree, the disciples get a glimpse of Jesus' glory, his true nature, his deity, his majesty is going to come burning through his humanity and his garments what an amazing thing. Do you just stop and contemplate that for a moment? Just think about that. In another gospel account, it, it talks about Jesus' face just literally seeming to, to burn with white light. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2, gives us a peek into this. Matthew chapter 17, verse 2. And after six days, Jesus took with him Peter. And James and John, his brother, and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun. And his clothes became white as light. And we see in Luke chapter 9, chapter 9, verse 29, we see again, according to Dr. Luke, and when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, no, that's not it. I'm in Mark. Let's go to Matthew, Mark, Luke. Chapter 9, verse 29, and it says, And he was praying, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. So we have Jesus, his glory is, is literally shining through as the veil of his humanity is temporarily peeled back. So we see, first and foremost, we see the revelation of God's glory. God the Son revealed who he, who he was. He didn't become who he had not been. Number two, notice here. Number two, notice, concerning the revelation of God's glory, that Christ has shared this same glory with us. Christ has shared, believer in Jesus Christ, this same glory with us. Turn with me, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we have the Apostle Paul writing. And he really is, is referencing Old Testament saints and Moses' experience on, Mount, on, on the mountain. And he says, yes, to this day, verse 15 of 2 Corinthians chapter 3, yes, to this day, whenever Moses is read, a veil lies over their hearts. But when one turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And listen, here's the key. And we all, believers, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. That is progressive sanctification. Because as the 
uh, righteousness of Christ is imputed to us, there then becomes a lifelong process of being conformed more and more to the image of glorious Christ. And the more we submit our lives to Him, and the more we dive into His Word, and the more we are transformed by the renewal of our minds, the more we are made into the likeness of Jesus Christ. And in a way, we are burning, we should be burning forth as Christ followers. And so believers today can, in a way, and one day we will receive glorified bodies as we enter into eternity with Him. We'll live in a glorious home, in our glorious bodies, in a glorious heaven, with our glorious Godhead. If you're looking forward to that day, say amen. Amen. So I have a question, or two or three or four or five for you. Are we engulfed in and in awe of God's glory as we live our lives? I think sometimes we can become rather uh, indifferent and, and we can read about Jesus Christ and we can read about the transfiguration, but are we in awe? I mean, not just in awe. I think we would be as terrified as Peter was if we were there and present for this transfiguration. But, you know, we have the benefit of looking back and reading what has been recorded for us. We have that benefit. Are we in awe of the glory of Christ? Are we engulfed in God's glory as we live our lives? Are we bowed down in worship? And worship really is the the manifestation of living out our lives each day. Our lives should be worship of Him. What does that look like? That looks like a testimony that's not being compromised before the world. That means uh, we are not going to engage in, in questionable behaviors, that we are not going to engage in questionable speech, that we are not going to invite reproach upon Christianity because we have some sort of a dichotomy between who we say we are and who we actually are. I think that if we can lay hold of and grasp and stand in awe of and be engulfed by the glory of God, that that may be somewhat of an inhibitor inhibitor to our, our, our um, temptation to compromise. Are we listening to Him? Sometimes we get so wrapped up in the busyness of our lives that we don't listen, meaning stop and breathe. Guilty as charged. And I think Our greatest lessons can be when we just stop and take a chill and let Him speak to us and let Him reveal His will to us as we stop for a moment to get into His Word and actually read it. When we read it, are we reflective as we read? When we read it, are we diligent to know what it says? When we read it, are we eager to see how it applies personally to us? Having a stance where we recognize the burning glory of Christ should humble us as we submit ourselves to His Lordship. And perhaps we need to slow down a little bit in order to realize that. So the transfiguration allows us to see Jesus for who he really is. Jesus is the revelation of God's glory. Jesus is the revelation of God's glory. Just look very quickly at John chapter 17, verse 5, if we could. John chapter 17, verse 5. You have to forgive me. I have so many cross-references going on here that uh, it's going to take a pause from time to time as I decide, do I want to go to this one or do I want to go to that one? Do I not want to go to this one at all? Do we want it? Bear with me. We'll keep moving through. 
But in John chapter 17, verse 5, this is just before the arrest of our Lord. And uh, Jesus is praying to the Father. He knows that he's going to be arrested. He knows that he is going to be going to the cross. And he is praying. He says, And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. This is why I can say and why we can agree together that the transfiguration was the revelation of God's glory. Because Jesus is God. And Jesus, as the word, the Logos, has existed since before the world was brought into existence. He was there at creation. He was with God. And nothing was made that was made except through him. So the transfiguration wasn't only a preview of the future. It was also a peek into eternity past. Because he has always existed. And had with the Father before the world began. Transfiguration allows us to see Jesus for who he really is. He's the revelation of God's glory. And he's also, number two, he's also the fulfillment of the law and prophecy. He is fulfillment of the law and prophecy. So we read here in in verse 4, we read, in verse 4, and there appeared to them Elijah with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. Interesting. Why Elijah and why Moses? Why were these Old Testament saints there with Jesus? And why Old Testament saints and why these two specifically? Well, remember that Jesus has already taken with him three human witnesses to be there for what he is about to unveil concerning himself. Here's Old Testament Satan witness number one. Fourth witness. And a powerful witness at that. Moses. Arguably Israel's greatest leader leading the Hebrews out of Egyptian captivity. MacArthur said this about Moses. In authority he was a king though he never had a throne. In message, he was a prophet. In service to God, he was every bit a priest, serving God on behalf of his people. He was the author of the Pentateuch, the agent by which God gave his holy law. He also led the people to the promised land as God had promised. But he, because of his sin, did not enter the promised land. And yet here he is standing on top of Mount Hermon. Listen, here is... Here is a message of grace for you and me. He's standing, presumably, upon Mount Hermon, which is the northern border of the promised land. Standing with Jesus, God the Son, looking out over the promised land. Knowing that he will one day reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom. And so we have Moses, regarded by these Jewish men, As the greatest. Christ, of course, is the greatest. And they will learn just how great he was, but it's going to take some time, probably post-resurrection for some of them. But here's Moses, a great patriarch of the Hebrew people. Interestingly, also, you remember the story, right? When Moses was, was confronted by God, and Moses was told to lead God's people out of Egyptian captivity... Exodus chapter 33. Let's go over there if we could for just a moment. Exodus chapter 33. Look at verse 18. God is is together there. He's with Moses. And Moses said, please show me your glory. Be careful what you ask for. He says, please show me your glory. And he said, I will make. All my goodness pass before you and will proclaim it before you, my name, the Lord. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious. And I will show mercy on whom I will show mercy. You know what? The graciousness of God and the mercy of God didn't consume Moses on the spot. The graciousness of God 
and the mercy of God doesn't send us to the hell that we all deserve. But by His grace, Jesus Christ took on humanity and went to the cross, Himself being the sacrifice once and for all to purchase our salvation. So we see the grace, the immutability of God is another lesson here. He does not change. And He demonstrates His graciousness and He demonstrates His mercy to Moses on the mountain. I'll be gracious, he says, but, he said, you cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. And the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me where you shall stand on the rock, and while my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft. He hides him in a rock. I will put you in a cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will take away my hand, and you shall see my back parts, but my face shall not be seen. Listen, as we are tempted in our lives to dismiss the glory of God, understand the extent to which the glory of God exists. We can't even comprehend it. A fraction of it will burn us up. And Moses got that lesson. And the same lesson is being applied here at the Transfiguration Mount. The radiance of God's glory and the exact imprint of his nature is what the writer of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 calls it. They gazed on the one at that moment, the radiance of God's glory. That's Christ, the exact imprint of his nature. That's Christ, Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3. So to these Jewish men who are there, Peter, James, and John, Moses is the greatest leader. But then there was another one. Enter, exhibit B, Elijah. Now, who is Elijah? And why is Elijah here? Well, he's arguably Israel's greatest prophet and the second heavenly witness. So we've got Peter, James, John, Moses, and Elijah. Moses delivered God's law, but Elijah was the one who fought against people's violations of God's law time and time and time again. There were two periods in the Old Testament of miracle working that happened. It was during Moses' day that miracles were performed by God, and we don't have time to go through them all, but I'll just say the ten plagues being one good example and many others beyond that. But then there was a period of time in which Elijah existed where miracles were performed. So there were really two miracle working periods of time uh, in the Old Testament. Elijah existed during one of them. Remember Elijah, 1 Kings chapter 18 and we're not going to have time to move there today, but it, it, he, he confronted the prophets of Baal, right? And there was a, a drought in the land. And Elijah said, come and just dump all of this water on the altar. Just soak it, saturate it. And then God brought fire from heaven, just consumed it all. Not just the wood, but the stone too. And Elijah didn't die. Elijah didn't die. He was taken into heaven. 2 Kings, 2 Kings chapter 2. Elijah is with Elisha the prophet. And, and uh, they're talking. And Elijah's tried to warn Elisha many times over that I'm going to be taken from you. <laughs> and in verse 11 of 2 Kings chapter 2, and as they still went on and, take, and talked, behold, chariots of fire and horses of fire separated the two of them, Elijah and Elisha. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. And Elisha saw it. And he cried, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel and its horsemen. And he saw him no more. And so Elijah is taken up into heaven in a whirlwind, a chariot of fire. And here he is on the Mount of Transfiguration, standing with Moses and Jesus. Let me suggest why. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17. Do not think that I have come. This is, this is the Sermon on the Mount. This is Jesus who is God on the Mount preaching a sermon. Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. 
Who's the greatest representative of the law? Moses. Who is the greatest representative of the prophets? Elijah. Who's present with Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration? Moses and Elijah. Jesus says, don't think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is abolished, all is accomplished. Who accomplished the law and the prophets? Who fulfilled it all? The person and the work. Of Jesus Christ. So here we have the representatives, these Old Testament saints of the law and the prophets standing there together with Jesus who will fulfill it all because they were all looking forward to that time. Moses gave the law. Elijah was the law's greatest guardian. They represent the law and the prophets and they are both witnesses, Old Testament saints from heaven. And they were talking with Jesus. They were talking with Jesus. What in the world were they talking? Don't you wish Mark had told us what they were talking about? Luke chapter 9. Luke chapter 9. Look at Luke chapter 9. Verse 30. Thankfully, Luke tells us what they were talking about. Luke chapter 9. Verse 30, and behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, verse 31, who appeared in glory. So they too were in a glorified state for that moment and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. What departure would that be? Going to the cross. He was going to the cross. They were talking about his death. And what happened? Peter opened his mouth. <laughs> Quick lesson. If you don't know what to say, be quiet. <laughs> Always a good policy. Or as my father used to say, zip it. So the question is, how was Jesus the fulfillment of the law and the prophets? There are a few ways. And I realize that, um, that we're going to move things along here. First, the Lord fulfilled the law as a teacher and as a doer. By what he said and by what he did, he never violated the law. You understand that, right? The Pharisees, the scribes, they tried to trip him up, but he never violated any law. He was sinless. He went to the cross completely unblemished and without sin. And according to, just, I'm going to give you some verses you can write down. Matthew chapter 22, Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 to 40. He taught people to obey the law. When he performed a miracle, he sent them to do what, what the law had told was prescribed for them to do. He never contradicted the law. He obeyed the law himself. You might, ah, oh, no, he healed on the Sabbath. He wasn't, no, he picked grain on the, no. We already went through this. He taught about this. It flows from the heart. In living a perfect life, he fulfilled the moral laws, and in his sacrificial death, he fulfilled ceremonial law. Jesus was the fulfillment of the law and the prophets in that way. He fulfilled hundreds of prophecies concerning himself. I only have time for a few of them. But in Matthew chapter 1, verse 22, it says that all of this happened to fulfill prophecy, which was that, he, behold, he will be born of a virgin. They shall call his name Emmanuel. Matthew chapter 1, verse 22. Jesus spoke in parables. Matthew chapter 13, verse 35. Because it was prophesied that he would speak in parables. Jesus is speaking in parables just as it had been prophesied that he would speak in parables. John chapter 19, verse 36. It had been prophesied that not one of his bones would be broken. And alas, none of his bones were broken. Luke chapter 24, verse 44. It says that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. 
Jesus in his person and in his work, in what he said and in what he did, fulfilled the law and the prophets. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1, says that, that uh, the ceremonies, the sacrifices, and the other elements of the old covenant were but a shadow of the good things to come instead of the true form of these realities. And the true form of these realities is embodied in the new covenant, covenant which is established by the Lord Jesus Christ. And just as the ceremonies and the sacrifices were shadows, the tabernacle and the temple where they worshipped were holy places made with hands, but they were never meant to be permanent because they were, according to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24, they were copies of the true things. So you see, he was the fulfillment. He completed it all. And only he could do that. And so Moses, Elijah, everything in the Old Testament was pointing to Christ. And when he came... He accomplished all that had been foretold. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God find their yes in Him. That is why it is through Him that we utter our amen to God for His glory. Moses and Elijah were two eyewitnesses from heaven. They were Old Testament saints. But you know what? There's about to be a third heavenly witness. And the greatest witness of all. And you only need this one. God the Father is about to speak. The transfiguration allows us to see Jesus for who he really is. He's the revelation of God's glory. And he is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. And number three, he is our divine teacher. He is our divine teacher. Jesus is the divine teacher. He is the one to whom we must listen and obey. Peter. And all of us, because we're all a bunch of Peters at one point in time or another. Now look at what Peter does. He, start, he starts out. Uh, this is a tale of the good and the bad. The good shouldn't take us too long. He says in verse 5, And Peter said to Jesus, Rabbi! Now that's good. That's good. Because it literally means my master. It's an honorable title for an esteemed teacher. Peter is obviously humbled, right? We see a spirit of humility and submission. And he goes on and he says, I got a great idea. We can make a tent. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. Now, this is good. He didn't suggest a tent for himself, right? You got you to gotta see the good in what's not recorded here. He, he didn't suggest in, in me. So that's, this is good. We see a spirit of humility. It's a great start. The bad can be captured in this way. It was, we have a series of evidences of fleshly foolishness. A series of evidences of fleshly foolishness. And this is very consistent. Because G Jesus has already rebuked him previously for thinking like man. Instead of thinking like God. He has a manly mindset. Immediately after his confession of Jesus Christ as the son of the living God. Almost immediately inserts foot into mouth. And we go back to chapter 8. And he says, uh, he pulls Jesus aside. In chapter 8, he pulls Jesus aside. Jesus just said the Son of Man must suffer many things. And he pulls him aside and starts to rebuke him, the text says. He had already confessed. And now he's receiving a stern rebuke from God the Son. And here he is again. And he's going to receive a rebuke from God the Father. So while Peter was... was um, was, was started, started out on the right foot, uh, very quickly, he is going to misstep. According to verse 5, Peter, really, by suggesting that a tent be made for all three, he was equating Moses and Elijah with Jesus. It, don't put these Old Testament saints on an equal playing field with Jesus, because there is no equal playing field. Jesus is God. And we are all subjected to him. Jesus is the son of God. Jesus isn't just another Moses or Elijah or even a greater Moses or Elijah. He is God the son. 
Peter again set his mind on the things of man, just like Mark chapter 8, verses 32 through 33, and that record of the Lord's rebuke puts it quite clearly. He says, he basically is saying, let's sit on this mountain, let's build temple, let's build tabernacles, let's, let's build tents, and let's stay here. Why? The kingdom has come. I mean, he sees Jesus and his glory bursting forth, and he sees what Elijah and Moses are bursting forth, and they're in a glorified state, and he thinks the kingdom's here. Glory has come. And he thinks what he wanted all along, which was to bypass the suffering and get to the glory, that his wishes have been honored. But no, he didn't understand in that moment. You see, discipleship, and this is what Jesus is trying to teach all of us. Discipleship means deny yourself. It means take up your cross. It means follow him. And the implication with all of that is death preceded by suffering. And we can't do that and selfishly stay on top of the Mount of Glory because there's work to be done in the valley below. And this is the message that Jesus is trying to communicate to him. If we want to share the glory of Christ on the mountaintop, we have to be willing to follow him in sufferings into the valley below. So, what do we see in verse 7? We see, we saw first, we saw Peter's suggestion, and now we see God's correction. Now, Peter was ready to honor all three, Jesus, Moses, and Elijah, and God intervenes and makes it quite clear that this is about Jesus. This is about my beloved son. This is about the one in whom I am well pleased. And he says two very important words to the guy that can't keep his mouth shut. Listen to him. No, that's three. Listen to him. Listen to him. Listen to him. Stop talking. Stop doing and listen. That was probably one of the most impactful messages for me this week. Stop talking. Stop planning. Stop organizing. Stop doing. And listen. Listen. Discipleship is not built on spectacular visions like the transfiguration. It's built on the unchanging word of God. It's Jesus only. His word, his will, his kingdom, his glory. God is the third heavenly witnesses. We've got six witnesses here on the Mount of Transfiguration. The transfiguration allows us to see Jesus for who he really is. He is the revelation of God's glory. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is our divine teacher. And he's also the rejected savior. He is the rejected savior, our fourth and final point. And if you have your, your elements for communion, I encourage you to have them ready. And if you don't have them, even while I am Getting into this final point, you can slip your hand up and someone will deliver it to you. Listen, Jesus is the Savior. He is the one who came to suffer and to die on our behalf. If you look at verse 9, you look at verse 9. And as they were coming down the mountain, he charged them to tell no one what they had seen. Why? Until the Son of Man had risen from the dead. So they kept the matter to themselves, questioning what this rising from the dead might mean. We, saints, who are looking back to the cross, we know what this suffering, we know what this death, and we know what this resurrection means. It hadn't happened yet. They didn't quite grasp what it meant. Peter wanted to bypass the suffering and get to the glory, and he thought, by golly, it's happened. Here we are. But that suffering was going to happen. Do you realize that in six months' time from the writing of this account that Jesus will be in the garden? Jesus will be betrayed? Jesus will be praying that high priestly prayer that I just read a portion of it a moment ago? Six months. Six months from now. He's going to be 
betrayed by one of his supposed disciples. And so as they came down from the mountain, the disciples had questions about what they had seen. They wondered about Elijah and the prophecies that that he would appear before the end would come. Just very quickly, Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. And the last book, Malachi of the Old Testament. Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. You have to imagine that these Jewish men were wondering about this. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. In Malachi chapter uh, 4, verse 4, let me read that for you. Remember the law of my servant Moses, the statutes and rules that I commanded him at Horeb for all Israel. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. They understood God's word. And they're asking, where's Elijah? Well, on the one hand, he just appeared. But on the other hand, John, who came in the spirit and the power of Elijah, had already had done to him exactly as they all had wished, which was his head on a platter. John came in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. He was a type of Elijah. And before the Lord comes again, and I don't have time to go there, but if you want to look it up, I think it's Revelation chapter 11, there are two witnesses that many scholars believe may very well be Moses and Elijah. So Jesus is absolutely correct in what he is saying here. Jesus said, I tell you, the prophecies of Elijah were fulfilled in the person of John the Baptist. Because Matthew chapter 17, verse 13, says that he came in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Perhaps they thought that they had seen the arrival of the great salvation that they were waiting for. And in a way, their great salvation that they had been waiting for had arrived. It's just that Jesus hadn't gone to the cross to purchase it yet. But the purchaser of their salvation is transfigured before their very eyes. And Jesus again announces, it's not ending here. I will be suffering and I will be dying. But I will be resurrected. 